so much for coming to our final event of the day, I believe. Um, we are here to talk about the role of business in the CNCF ecosystem and around open source projects. Um, so we're not gonna pull punches. Um, I think we're all capitalists. We're all, to a certain extent, hippie capitalists, more or less, I don't know. Uh, I think that goes a little bit, actually, with people who work in the open source ecosystem and yet are also building businesses. And um, that's the, the context to, to set. I'm Emily O'Meara, by the way. I uh, host a podcast called The Business of Open Source. I am a consultant who works with open source companies on their product strategy. And I also founded a conference called Open Source Founder Summit uh, that is all about building open source companies. And I'm joined by Tyler Jewell, who has a long history in open source companies right now. He's the CEO of Lightbend. And this is number three or number four? Number four. Number four. Uh, so number four, uh, open source company. William Morgan, who is the evil mastermind behind Buoyant. That is how he told me to introduce him. Uh, I, said, I said that was optional if you wanted to say that. I think we're actually ordered from like most evil to least evil, so I'm, I'm just. Wait, so I, wait, okay. wait, are you including me? Uh, that's off. <laughs> Uh, then we have Avi Press, <laughs> who is the, the founder of Scarf, <laughs> and Mark, um, who is CEO of Diagrid. So the first question that I want to start us out with is for William and Mark specifically, because both of them have projects that are, or I don't even know what the right verb to use is, have, maintain, are behind, um, projects that are hosted by the CNCF. And my question for you both is, knowing what you know now and the experiences that you've had now with having a, a project that's housed by the CNCF, would you do it again? Would you donate the project to the CNCF again? And uh, why or why not? All right, well, I'll take that one first because uh, you went straight for the, the difficult question. Um, I mean, a little bit of history about how Dapper ended up in CNCF is just from a bit of context is because, you know, I was working at Microsoft at the time with my co-founder and, you know, we developed Dapper at uh, Microsoft and we wanted to get it out of the hands of Microsoft into a foundation so that it could be you know, neutral vendor and that, thing. and that side of things I think is really good because that way you can have any organizations take part of it or but of course you know you're also and then the advantages if you do go to CNCF is brand awareness you know a great uh, organization that promotes these things and, and community building I think those are all fabulous things that the CNCF provides for you and you can gain a lot from that and Dapper the open source project which by the way graduated this week yeah congrats yes. October, October um, 30th right Sorry? October 30th, right? October the 30th, yes, yeah, it was just for graduate. And, you know, it's been an amazing journey. And I think, you know, the, the CNCF has sort of shepherded that through. Um, and, you know, you've seen the, the Dapper brand grow with inside all of that. Um, so, you know, through that lens, yes. But, you know, from a startup lens perspective, you know, or the other side of things is that you, you do lose control of the project. Um, you know, the, one of the things I think is the biggest challenge with inside CNCF is that you've got to tie your company's identity to an open source project and do that well. Um, and that's not very easy because there's Dapper and Diagrid and we constantly remind ourselves that Dapper is not Diagrid. They're two different things and you have to work triply hard to do all of that. Um, and you, you can't go into the community and start, in fact, the CNCF are not really, say, not really helpful in helping you promote your products very well inside their ecosystems that you've developed at all. In fact, you know, they really don't help you monetize in any way. And so I think that's a really difficult thing that we have. And we've, we've suffered that. We built a great Discord community, but can we go in there and talk a lot about Diagrid products? No, we can't. And, you know, they're like, no, 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 you can't do that. You know, it's gotta, you've got to have to separate the two out. So, you know, and I've started a different Discord community and tried it all together. And it's just a, a, a complete pain. Um, so you know, that side of things you know, is a really hard measure around these things. And so you have to work hard at that. So would I do it now? I think I still would, yes, for certain, because of the advantages of the ecosystem around all of these things. Um, I mean, we're also lucky in the sense that as a company, we've become the primary maintainers for the project as well. So we can sort of control the open source a lot more of what happens. And I think that's important. I think, I think if we didn't have that, 
I think it'll be really, really, really hard for us. Yeah, I'll say from the Linkerd perspective, joining the CNCF was unequivocally good for Linkerd, but we joined, you know, as project number five. You know, so we joined in like 2017. It was Kubernetes, it was Prometheus, it was, you know, etcd or whatever, and it was Linkerd. So for us, as like a three-person team or whatever we were at the time, it was just like this profound kind of um, stamp of approval, even though it's not really supposed to be that, um, because we were so early. Uh, obviously, there's, like Mark said, there's a lot of downsides to, to, to doing that. One of the big ones being you give up control of the trademark, and that means you know, as a founder, once you are thinking about developing a, an enterprise product or once you're, you know, even thinking about naming your company, you don't have control over the kind of the core product that you're devoting a lot of marketing to. And how you address that and, and kind of how big of an impact that has on your business, I think, depends on a lot of things. In part, it depends on what kind of relationship your company has with the product. So for a company today, I think the equation is, you know, if you were doing, if you were considering donating to the CNCF today, I think the equation is a lot more Nuance is not quite as clear, but for us, because we were in there early, it was a it was a big benefit. And I just want to point out that, especially for open source companies, that trademark can be extremely important um, because you don't uh, have control over all the ways your code is being used, but you can have control over the way your name is being used, and that can be extremely important. Tyler, I know you also have a good I, I, a I good was just going to add a story to this, just, you know, as you're thinking about what to do, uh, you know, I spent a decade on the board of WSO2. They were just acquired earlier this year by EQT for $600 million. And, you know, the interesting story, in 2005, that company was started, and the very same week, uh, MuleSoft uh, ESB was started uh, within like days of each other and they talked about combining one another but they decided to go on their separate ways and WSO2 proactively donated everything they could to the Apache Software Foundation and MuleSoft didn't and, and for those of you who don't remember MuleSoft exited about eight years ago for six and a half billion dollars. Is there, is there a moral somewhere? <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> dry I just thought own, dry, it was an interesting data point. To draw your own <laughs> conclusions. <laughs> so going back then to the idea of being open source hippies, and this is sometimes a frustration I know for people building companies in the, open, in the CNCF ecosystem, is that we talk about, a lot about community. But here's the question. Why should a community member, a user of the software, why should they care about the health of the company behind the, the project? Avi, since we skipped you on that last one, you want to start? Um, let's see. I mean, I think it's all about the expectations that you need to have as a user of a given project. So, you know, if you are not thinking at all about how a project gets made and the company behind it is unhealthy, well, there, you know, there might be significant changes to how the company supports the project, right? There might be significant changes to how they commercialize the project. Um, you know, ultimately, the, the development of the software is not free. It costs money, and the health of that organization behind it is pretty intimately tied to the development of that software going forward. And, you know, I think we can all, like... Yeah, in theory, this is open source and a new company could come in and take it over, but you know, in practice, that's not really what happens most of the time. Like there's, the reality is there's a ton of single, like of, you know, uh, w single vendor open source projects where it's mainly one company that's doing the bulk of the work. Um, and you know, the, the health of that company will be really, really important to anyone who's depending on the project. So I think it would be, I don't know, borderline negligible to not focus on who's behind the software that you depend on. It still surprises me, though, that you go to large organizations and they think of the open source project and they look at it all and they say, it's free. Um, and they still say those words and they're like, well, it's not free because there are paid maintainers somewhere doing this work for you around those things. And so, you know, there's, there has to be some sort of models of forcing functions around those things. I mean, there are things that have merged now where you know, certain organizations have to take out contracts, you know, with a, you know, an open, a vendor that supports their open source work uh, inside that. And, and, you know, particularly, you know, in the EU, some of that's happening around those things. But, I mean, just generally, you know, they have to have 
you know, particularly in sort of the financial space, they have to have those pages. And, and I wish there was more of that, but you know, you still get this perception about it's kind of free, even with developers who know that they're using something that's not. Yeah, I'll just add, I think, you know, there are many different ways to have open source projects. And if you look at something that's like a, you know, a, a JavaScript library where the audience are JavaScript developers and the, de and the library developers themselves are JavaScript developers and everyone's kind of used to interacting with this library in a particular way, you'll find something that is very different from uh, the type of project that we see in the, in the CNCF. The type of projects that we see here, very infrastructure focused, our audience is usually not uh, people who spend all day writing Go code or, uh, or Rust code in, in our case. Um, it's usually SREs or DevOps folks or Kubernetes operators who are taking these projects and are trying to do something you know, with them in, in kind of in service for their business. And that dynamic lends to a particular type of open source project. And in, in, and in our case, you know, if you look in the, if you kind of narrow that down to how do things work in the CNCF, you, the spectrum is kind of like everyone's a paid maintainer. So we don't really have projects that are nights and weekends volunteer efforts. In some other communities, you might see that. Certainly historically, that's been kind of the model. You know, like when I started with open source in the olden days and we passed around stacks of, you know, floppy disks to install Linux in, it was like, it was this uh, grassroots nice nights and weekends anti-capitalist movement where we were like going to take down Microsoft and we'd spend spell Microsoft with a dollar sign and you know we, we felt good. Um, that you know now it's a very different type of project, at least in this ecosystem, right? We want are you feeling maintenance. nostalgia right now? Oh, it's so <laughs> great! I mean, life was so simple back then. All we had to do was take down Microsoft. Obviously, that didn't work. Um, but you know, uh, now, we we don't really. I, we want our maintainers to be paid, right? So like, if our, if, if our maintainers are going to be paid, then there has to be some kind of commercial actor involved. And so you end up with the type of projects that we see in the CNTF. And I think there's a really interesting, you know, kind of debate internally in the community around what, you know, how much do we care about single vendor projects versus multi-vendor projects? And like, what are the kind of consequences when multiple vendors get involved? Is that better for stability? You know, are single vendor projects bad? We've always been, that's always been kind of like an attack on Linkerd is that we were so um, upfront about our single vendor nature. So there's, you know, there's an inter interesting fight to be had about that. Um, but yeah, I think ultimately, <laughs> Yes, I'm coming to my conclusion now. Ultimately, if you're in a world where you have paid maintainers and you have kind of cor corporate backers of projects, then I would say, yeah, you really need to care about it because the health of that corporate backer is kind of tantamount to the health of the project. You, I, I, can I take a tangent on that? You just said something about the single vendor versus the multi-vendor. And, um, you, you know, it's not a big portion of the market, but just, and I can't name names, but there are uh, certain publicly traded companies who uh, they've started in their procurement processes uh, will only adopt open source if the vendor who's going to support it will indemnify the IP, not just of the IP that the vendor created, but all the transitive dependencies underneath and included inside of it. Right? And they're asking for unlimited liability on that. And so when you have a multi-vendor project, you know, who's going to be responsible for offering that legal promise? Now, have I seen it of the, of the thousands of companies I've engaged with? Less than 2%, but they're big companies and the checks that they write are big. So let's dial in more about the, the relationship between the foundation and companies. And I want to address this both because we're here at an event that's sponsored by CNCF uh, and also because this is a, a big failure mode. Like sometimes when companies fail, one of the things that the, one of the, the reasons for the failure can be or, or at least the, the founder of the company can feel like is a, because the, the relationship with the foundation just didn't work. Um, this isn't like, the CNCF is not the only open source foundation out there. And all of the, the foundations that I know of are very explicit about the fact that they are not there to support companies. They are there to ensure the survival of projects uh, and the sustainability of projects, but not companies. My question for you guys is, 
What should that relationship between the company and the foundation look like? How, like, how could it be improved given what foundations stand for and what their mission is? Yeah, I mean, I'll take this one, and that is, you know, I think there needs to be a much closer relationship between the two, for certain. Um, and I think the foundation has to have some responsibility for the companies around them. I mean, because if they don't have commercial entities around them, the projects don't succeed um, in many ways. I mean, if you look at, I mean, I'll take Helm, for example. I mean, there's no commercial entity around Helm, and so the project hasn't really grown very much and kind of has stagnated, I would say, really, uh, in, in terms of what it's done over the last few years. And then those projects that do have commercial companies around them have tend to thrive and get bigger and grow and become you know, bigger user base. And so it's in their interest to have a thriving set of companies. You know, I think they like to have things like, if you like uh, open telemetry, it clearly has a big thriving ecosystem and there's a lot of competitors around it all, driving it all, and they, they have a shared goal to make it all successful between them all. Um, so there, there are a variety of projects. You get, say, ones like Helm that have no commercial entities, uh, Open Telemetry have a lot of driving factors inside them all, and then you get ones that sit in between. But if they don't, you know, the projects will, you know, I think, stagnate, and over time, you know, they'll be forced to kind of effectively um, archive them and things like this. So in their interest, they, they need to find ways of saying, how is it that we can make sure that your products, because you know, the way CNCF describes it is they want to support product projects that support products that allow you to create profits. So if they say there's a statement and they're talking about profits for a company, and then the products that people have should have be a way of being promoted a little bit better with inside the CNCF. When you come here and you know, you're going to remain completely neutral about your products, you can't stand up in any of your talks and go, let me talk about these things or the whole company. You know, that's like, no, 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 you're going to talk about the projects themselves. And so that relationship has to be a lot stronger and a lot more explicit about it. Should nonprofits start showing favoritism to various projects? under their umbrella, or should they maintain non-bias? <laughs> well, I, I think that's an excellent question, but it's, I don't think they have to show preference to any particular project under their umbrella in order for them to m have a tighter relationship with the commercial entities uh, of, of all of them. I mean, we're, we're not saying like pick one and make them succeed, although it is more challenging if you have a, an ecosystem, um, a, a true multi-vendor uh, project, uh, then yeah, is there a way to do that without, without playing favorites? I'm not sure. But thinking more like, should foundations try to uh, rise all boats? William, you, you look like you want to say something. Yeah, you know, I'll give a recent example. So we've, we've kind of had, um, we've seen both sides of this with the, with the CNCF. I'll say, and I'm, it's not my usual role to be like a CNCF apologist, but I actually think that they've been quite, uh, they've been quite good um, in terms of uh, allowing, business, allowing businesses to thrive in the sense that we have done things recently that have made the Linkerd community kind of like up in arms, or maybe the whole, not, not the Linkerd community, the, the, the open source community kind of up in arms, and, and the CNCF has, has been very clear with us that what you did was fine, and like, yes, we want businesses to exist and to be able to do these sorts of things. And so, you know, that was kind of my understanding, but it's also great to see that, you know, put together in practice. Um, on the other hand, I think there is this weird kind of, in the, in the community as a whole, there's this, this kind of like distaste for the, the, the fact that there are vendors here and we kind of like, we try to play this, uh, we maintain this polite fiction where we're all here in this, you know, kind of uh, harmonious, um, you know, uh, effort for kind of the good of mankind. And yes, there's vendors and like they stay in their little hall over there and we don't, we don't go in there unless we want socks or whatever, but like, you know, really here we're for the project and for the community. And, and I think that, that when you start scratching the surface that falls apart pretty, pretty rapidly. And I think that kind of attitude or that uh, fiction that we maintain is a source of some of the tension. And I think, you know, we, we could, I would argue we should be more cognizant of the fact that, hey, everyone here pretty much, maybe there's 1% who are not, but 99% of the people who are here are here for commercial purposes, either because you're 
an evil vendor trying evil vendor trying to sell stuff, or uh, because you're here because your your company paid you to be here because you're evaluating software, so you can you know decide whether you want to bring it back uh, into your company's ecosystem to help build that business, right? Everyone here is basically a paid actor, so I think if we can be a little more uh, uh, a little more cognizant of that, um, some of the arguments kind of like will diminish. I super agree about the being upfront about what the what everyone's incentives are and the relationships between everyone in the community. Um, I mean, you know, when it comes to like governance or these kinds of things, like the foundation is doing a lot of work to make all of these relationships very explicit. And I think has shied away from doing that with the vendors because you have to have this, the, the neutrality, vendor neutrality and variant is really important and it's hard to do. Um, but you know, like the fact that, the fact that Diagrid can't talk to people in the Dapper Discord, like is that really helpful? I, I, I would argue probably not. Like you can let other vendors do it too. And like th there's concrete ways where you can support the vendors without violating the, the neutrality piece. Um, but I think ultimately, yeah, I guess two things I would say here. So yeah, one is that making these relationships much more explicit really is good for everyone and does align them. And I would say it's the foundation's job to do, quite frankly. Um, the second thing that I would say here is that I, I actually do think the CNCF, to their credit, does do some things to support vendors in ways that are not quite as obvious. Um, and one of them that I think is really interesting, actually, um, is about SCARF. You know, we, we do usage analytics for open source, and that has been historically taboo, like very, very massively unpopular, right? And this, uh, the Linux Foundation was the first foundation to approve that at the foundation level of any foundation that we work with. And that's like a real, I would say it's a huge deal. Um, and you know that was something that they like listened to projects to make that happen. Like there was enough projects that were trying this and playing around with it and of interest that they they did the work to like do a security audit on us and do all the you know the the data privacy stuff. And that also took money. Like they had to have a lot of lawyers look at all the stuff they were doing, and that also is very expensive. But that I think benefited the projects and the companies behind the projects quite a bit. Um, but that's not, I think that's a much more subtle thing. Um, but yeah, so I think there, there's a lot of ways where the CNCF is really helping behind the scenes, I think, that are less obvious. But being explicit is good, and we should do more of that. <laughs> I, I, I just want to follow up on one thing that when, um, something off you said, which is that uh, when you build actors with Akka and Dapper, that's free. There's no paid actors with that model. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Very good. Very good. So I really liked the, the phrase polite fiction, William, that you used, because I think it's very polite. Uh, you could also say that the, the phrase that I had in my head was like intellectual dishonesty, intellectual dishonesty. And I think that there's an element of that that comes from the ecosystem, but in my experience, it can also come from founders themselves, from the people who are behind the projects themselves sometimes uh, thinking that they can just sort of magically have a project that is somehow going to turn into profits, like uh, underpants gnome style. And I think that often there has to be a sort of um, uh, come to Jesus moment for a lot of founders where they figure out that that isn't actually how it works. Um, how does it work? Well, you have to have product market fit, yes? <laughs> you know, if you don't have something that people don't care about and you solve a problem, then no one cares about anything you do, really. So, I mean, I guess you know, you're assuming that you as a founder have understood a space very well and you're building something that people love and are enjoying and things like this. And, you know, that's what we like to think about the projects that we have inside CNCF for certain. Um, you know, I certainly I think that's in Dapper Space is very, you know, solves a really hard problem for developers building distributed applications. So, given that, you know, you then you as a ven uh, then you as a founder, a better way, way better find out ways to make money from that. Yes, and you're going to be very profit driven. And you know, frankly, you know, in the space as William pointed out, you know, we're very much in the kind of enterprise space, as it were, on the whole, about those sort of vendors. And so, you've got to sort of target the enterprises in the world and make sure that they understand your message and it comes across really well. So if you're not focused on that as a, vendor, as a founder, 
and you know turning that pro and, and playing both sides of it were you know growing it with inside the CNCF ecosystem and making sure you invest in that and it does take a lot to invest in that you know we spend a lot of time at Diagrid investing in the community you know community managers you know talking on the aliases um, you know helping out people that will have no commercial value to us just to kind of help them I mean uh, in any way but at the same time if you don't find ways of making sure that you have a really sellable product that lands with them as, as a founder, then of course, you know, you're, you're not going to survive. <laughs> and just to clarify, you just having product, project market, product market fit for your project isn't enough. No, correct. Yeah. As I said, you know, Di Dapper is not Diagrid and the two, you've got to separate those two. So, I mean, that's why you've got to start doing things, you know, you see this all the time. People, you know, create their own distros of whatever, you know, they want to do of their projects or, you know, or they, they wrap additional features around it all. I mean, that's the path that you have to do. You have to take the open source project, build features around it all, sell it as a differentiated thing because, you know, that's the way to make money around these things. So you're playing both sides of it at the same time. And that gets tricky and those things. But, you know, at the same time, you'd probably have to do that anyway to, you know, even when you had an open source project. A uh, talk of Adam Jacobs was like making me cry in the back because all the mistakes he was talking about were like literally mistakes we had made, you know, one after the other. And, you know, we spent so long with Linkerd kind of chasing, effectively building a product, not just a project, but a product, making it free, chasing after like market share, you know, without really a thought towards commercialization, investing all this time in the community. And at some point, you know, we had, uh, last year, basically, we had our come to Jesus moment. We had our, uh, you know, the, the, just like the kind of Docker moment that Scott Johnson spoke about. It's like, we need to do something drastically different. And so, you know, we did it and, and it worked, which is great. And now I can like, you know, wake up not dreading the, the day anymore. But it was way more painful than it had to have been. And I think if we had kind of set that uh, set that path out earlier in the journey, we would have had a much more pleasant time of, of making the transition from like open source project that everyone likes but no one has any reason ever to pay for to uh, you know where we are now, which is open source project that not everyone likes but everyone has a good reason to pay for. <laughs> yeah, and if you missed the Adam Jacobs' talk, I highly recommend you go back and, and listen good. to it. It was stunningly good. So we're getting close to time to wrap up. And that means that I wanna actually switch the, the tone of the conversation. So we've been here complaining about open source. We ask you questions now. Uh, we could do that, we could do that. Actually, no. <laughs> um, but we've been here complaining about all the things that are challenging about open source companies. That is not the full story. So how does, what I should say, what are the opportunities that are unique to an open source company, how can, in fact, having an open source project as part of your suite help you be profitable? Tyler, you wanna take it? Uh, certainly, I mean, you, you know, the, the first thing that happens when you have, you know, a great open source project is uh, a different kind of relationship with your users and your community. And when you have users and community that are enthusiastic champions for the technology that you're working on, that has um, intangible, you know, uh, almost non-quantifiable, non-financial benefits that affect the employees that are working with it, the, uh, the rest of the community, the contributors, the maintainers, and that is almost irreplaceable on any on any aspect to that. And so that to me is the biggest benefit of building an open source community and nurturing that as the intangibles. Is that specific to open source? Is there something about open source that you know drives that sort of thing versus like a SaaS startup? I, I, I think that, yeah, there is something different because you, you know, there's a lot of SaaS startups, a lot of free software that's out there, but when you do an open source project, uh, the people who tend to engage, who become the strongest champions are those people who have uh, similar uh, similar objectives to you, and there's also probably some willingness to find a way to contribute, even if it's not making software contributions, there's other types of contributions that they can make. Um, and so open source projects tend to bring people who are more willing to be collaborative than just straight up commercial software. 
One kind of interesting anecdote that I can share about this. So we work with lots of companies that are you know, commercializing open source in one way or another. And one thing that we hear sometimes from executives at these companies is, well, we're going to deprioritize our open source. We're going to focus much more on our cloud offering because that's where we're going to make a lot more money. Um, we've heard that about five times in the last year, and all of them are leaning more into their open source now than they were before. And why are they doing that? Because as they invest all this time into their paid offering, the open source project is just sitting there growing massively. And it's just too good of an opportunity to not invest in. Um, I think, yeah, there's something really to be said for you know, the frictionless adoption and having you know, developers pick the thing up and start to try it out, and that's a, that's a huge asset to a business. And, just been hearing it over and over that people want to ditch it and they choose not to because it's just not the right, uh, just not the, the rational thing for them to do. Yeah, Mark, I'll go back to the contributors. You know, it's, it's about, again, sort of building community and there are people who just love, certainly on the de sort of developer tool space, you know, they very much like to get into the developer tools, understand it, and kind of they build their own careers around it all. So there are plenty of people who build a career you know, working in open source projects and then become very well known for that and they themselves and go on and turn that into newsletters and, uh, and guidance and advice and things like that, particularly if the open source project grows itself. So, I mean, sort of those kind of heroes, advocates that you can nurture, I think is an important part of helping you build your ecosystem and extending your reach. Because, you know, as a, particularly as a small company, you've got to extend your reach as much as you possibly can. So that's what enables you to try and do. Um, I mean, also I would say that, you know, you get the large vendors as well who like to look at the open source from a legal perspective and things like this, but maybe that's kind of not so demanding because they could probably come to that anyway if, if you're even if a closed source company. But, uh, but yes, I would say that just you know, extending the reach into communities and building communities and kind of other people establishing their careers around it all is probably the primary factor around it. Yeah, I think this is a, a good place to, to wrap up. It's exactly what I wanted people to take away from this panel, is that there's some serious risks, um, but also some opportunities that come from a, building an open source company. And Tyler, the, the, that you mentioned about the, the sense of ownership is what I was thinking that you can, you can get in a community. Um, I think that is one of the things you can find in open source communities that just doesn't have, like in a, even a, a SaaS product that you use for free, I've never heard of or seen a community and the sense of ownership among the users that you can find in, in a lot of open source companies and their communities. That's time. So thank you for, for joining us. Uh, I'm sure everyone is willing to, to chat afterwards. Um, thank you. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.